Yesterday we had George Dago's memorial service here, and uh, it was a beautiful time remembering our dear brother who went to be with the Lord, and I, I just was so overwhelmed with the power of the gospel and the, the love of the body of Christ. This man was in prison for 23 years, and he was saved there, and several people from the church came in and taught Bible studies and preached and shared, and uh, Rick Hallahan had a huge impact in his life, and the day he was released from prison, uh, Rick was there to meet him and guide him back into society and help him journey, and then the, the body of Christ came alongside of him in such a beautiful way, and he became ill, uh, had the, the liver replaced, and, and then the bone cancer, and this church kept him from having to worry about his daily bread, uh, just how God provided and then this, this group that came alongside of him and loved him so beautifully and helped him die with his sweet faith holding to Christ, and now he's received his reward. But it was just kind of the beauty for me to watch how the whole thing works if we get Romans, this gospel, and how it works into our lives, how it works out. Uh, that is my prayer, that, that we're, we're tasting these things. They're so beautiful, and I just want to see them explode and continue to go to the ends of the earth. So... That's my heart. Hallelujah. What a beautiful day it was remembering such a precious life. Well, last week we began our study through Romans. I introduced it and we took a look at verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And so we looked at this, this writer, Paul, who hated Christians and he was saved mightily on the road to Damascus and gave his life to proclaim the Christ that he persecuted anyone who named his name. Uh, a few descriptions about him as he began. He's a doulos. He's a bondservant. My will is now his will. It's been taken captive because of his work and who his person is. I've been called as an apostle. I have the authority of God to go forth and proclaim this gospel to the Gentiles. And I have been set apart now for the gospel of God. I, I, I've been set apart now to give my life to proclaim the excellencies of Almighty God in Christ Jesus, this gospel. We've been doing, we're going to be doing fighter verses through this journey for us to work on and memorize some of the main sections through Romans. And last week was Romans 1, 1 through 4. And the good news is this week is Romans 1, 1 through 4. So if you memorized it, good job. Just kind of polish it up a little more this week. And then if you want, if you did, and you got to memorize next week's Romans 1, 5, if you want to get ahead. So this morning, we're going to take up verses 2 through 4, Lord willing. And we want to build off of that amazing phrase at the end of verse 1. And just something I didn't park on is that he was set apart for the gospel. But I just love this little preposition phrase, of God. He, the, the gospel of God. <clears throat> and I don't think we should hurry past that. We love this gospel. This gospel is good news. It's God's good news. It's the best news. <laughs> it's not Paul's gospel. It's not the apostles' gospel. It's not the early church's gospel. I want you to hear that this morning. This is God's gospel. This is the creator of the universe's gospel, the ultimate one, the sovereign one. The one who everyone is going to stand before him on the day of judgment. That one with all authority. This is his gospel to us. This is his gospel. That is why we can bank on everything that is in this gospel because it's God's. And this is how I know it's trustworthy because it's God's gospel. It's his good news to this world. Oh, the blessed gospel of God. This morning, Paul has some beautiful truths that he wants us to know about this gospel of God, this gospel concerning his son. And so I want to go before this God and I want to pray and ask the God of this gospel to fill our hearts with joy and peace and believing so that it might result in the obedience of faith, so that he will be glorified as the God of this gospel and all of its fruits thereof that we are seeking together as a body of Christ. So let's go to the God of this gospel. Father, we do come before you and we thank you for your gospel. We thank you that it's the outworking of your very essence, your very character. And so our hearts are full that the sovereign of the universe is a God full of justice and holiness, a God who dwells in unapproachable light, 
and a God who hates sin, a God who has sent his own son to deal with sin. Oh, we thank you for this gospel. We thank you that you are a merciful God. That is the best news there ever could be. Our God is merciful through his son. And so, Lord, we thank you for this gospel. And I pray now as we begin to unpack it that your spirit would do that work. Lord, that you would now take the words that he inspired, that they are the words of God, God breathed, and that you would now take them and illuminate them to every mind and heart sitting in this place right now. God, let us stare into the heart and essence of your gospel. Amen. This morning, we'll look at verses 2 through 4. So the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his holy prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, and he was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want to give you an outline that we're going to be working through. Uh, in Romans 1, 1 through 7, this first section of Paul's introduction, he's going to give us five considerations concerning the good news of the gospel. And last week we looked at the first one, the preacher, <clears throat> the preacher of the good news, Paul. This morning we'll look at the second point, the promise of the good news in verse 2, <clears throat> in verses 3 through 4, as we'll look at this morning as well as the person of the good news. And then next week, we will look at the product of the good news, the obedience of the faith and God's glory. And next week as well, we'll look at the people of the good news. That phrase I cannot get over is to all those who are beloved of God in Rome. And so we'll begin unpacking those glorious truths to the children of God. So let's take a look at our second point. So the preacher last week was Paul. This is the promise of the good news in verse 2 which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. And so as we begin this morning, I just want you to hear that this gospel is not new. This gospel is not throwing away all the history of Israel and all of the sacred scriptures of the Old Testament. What is this new preaching, Paul? What are you proclaiming? Was our first 2,000 years nothing? Please don't miss that this gospel of God has been his divine plan and purpose for all of eternity. <laughs> all of eternity. This gospel is out of God's eternal purposes that he promised in his, his gospel. And this gospel is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament promises that it would be. It's all grounded in divine promise. So this is not new news. It is not novel News And again, it's not Paul's news, it's the old news, it's the old, old story from the beginning. From everlasting to everlasting is this story. It's consistent and it's in harmony, this gospel, with all of the Old Testament scriptures. The whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the whole unfolding plan of God, it is always pointed to and promised the gospel that Paul is proclaiming in this letter. Look at our text, verse 2. It's a gospel, this God gospel he promised beforehand. This gospel did not come about from something that happened in history. It didn't come about because the serpent deceived Adam and Eve and they ate from a tree and now i got to come up with a plan. The fall did not come and, and now the flood came upon the earth and it didn't fix man's heart and a new generation began doing the same things again so I must come up with a gospel. I need a plan. I need a gospel. That is not what happened. Please hear this clearly. The plan of salvation, the plan of God's mercy, the gospel of God was promised from long ago. For all of eternity, it's been in the heart, the heart of the Godhead Father, Son, and Spirit, this plan to save a fallen race, and in a way that would put on display the glory and the beauty of our God that we will look at next week, Lord willing. So this has been God's plan from the beginning, that it is running perfectly according to plan. It cannot be stopped or thwarted. It's perfectly unfolding even this day as we sit here in Southside Bible Church. <laughs> the promise in Genesis 3 
That God says, I'm going to send a seed into the world who's going to crush the serpent's head and undo the works of the devil that have destroyed this earth and our hearts and our lives. We move forward to Genesis 12 and God calls out Abram, Abraham, and he says, through your seed, Abraham, the nations are going to be blessed. And I just want you to listen to what Paul said about that in Galatians 3. He said, the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying that all the nations will be blessed in you. This gospel was preached to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, the gospel of God. This promise from long ago. The Old Testament just lays out this plan by narratives, by promises and types and shadows and by people and ceremonies and actions and laws. As the writer of Hebrews said, in many portions and in many ways, the gospel of God was painted beautifully and perfectly through the whole Old Testament. It's not a new message. Nothing new was promised beforehand. How? Through His holy prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I love the book of Acts. After Pentecost, the apostles begin preaching now with passion and courage. And they take the Old Testament scriptures and they go and start telling the world they've been fulfilled. All of the promises that we've been waiting for have been fulfilled in Christ. The gospel is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament has been promising and their eyes are opened. And now they see the beauty of this gospel having been laid out perfectly since since Genesis all the way through Malachi. And they they, they can see now and they get it. And, And so this isn't a new gospel, it's a fulfilled one. Paul will quote the Old Testament throughout this letter of Romans, showing us that it's God's gospel and it's from the Old Testament promises. This has been his plan and his purpose from all along. We live in the age of the fulfillment of the gospel of God. We live in the day of the ingathering of the nations to call upon this one who came and fulfilled the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we live in a very unique, beautiful, special time of harvest with this gospel. Let it land this morning then. I just want you to really grab hold of this. This gospel is God's gospel. And He's been revealing it perfectly for thousands of years so that nobody would miss it. So that we would marvel at at a God who makes history and paints with it His glory and His beauty by this gospel of Jesus Christ. This is so beautiful. To me. The gospel is God's promise to forgive your sin and remember your iniquities no more, to bury bury them in the deepest sea, and to cleanse you perfectly and eternally by the blood of his Redeemer, Jesus his Son, not bulls and goats. Christ in our place, taking our wrath that we deserved, so we could receive God's great mercy in Jesus Christ and be reconciled back to our God. So we preach this gospel. God has fulfilled his promise, and he will fulfill the rest of his promises. We have a redeemer who was born into this world, and he lived, and he died on a cross, and he was buried, and he was raised on the third day, and he is seated at the right hand of God. This salvation was not just for Israel, but for all who will be of the faith of Abraham to the gospel that God preached to him. And so this is the promise of God. And it's just saturated in the Old Testament. There's a unity of revelation from cover to cover that reveals the glory of a God who saves. And it all flows from the heart and the mind of God. This is His gospel. And so guys, we stand on the Holy Scriptures because it's God's gospel. And Paul is on trial before Agrippa. Listen to what he said in Acts 26. He said, for this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. And so having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing, but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by the reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim Uh, light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. 2 Timothy 3.15 From childhood, Timothy, you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom 
that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. This word is inspired by God. It's God breathed so that we can find salvation through Jesus Christ, through God's gospel. And so we've seen the preacher of the good news. It's Paul. The promise of the good news, this isn't a new message. It should lift your hearts. It's the fulfillment of everything that God was promising and painting for thousands of years. When you look at Christ and begin to see the Old Testament for what it's worth, it's overwhelming to the soul. This is the gospel of God. And so what I want to do with the rest of our time is in our third point now, is I want to look at the person then of the good news. There's promise of good news, but there's the person of the good news. And we'll look in verse 3, concerning his son. Concerning his son. Uh, God's gospel is concerning his son. You, You take Christ out of the gospel and you have no gospel. Take him out of the Bible and it's a dark book. This world is happy with any message that excludes Christ. Go make up a religion and take Christ out of it and they'll love you. Put them in it and they're going to hate you if you declare the true Christ. You you gut the gospel if you take Jesus Christ out of it. I want you to hear this. Christ comes on the scene into the world and he claims four times that he is the theme of the entire canon of all of the Old Testament scriptures. And I apologize because... Curtsy, where is he? (laughs) You dirty dog. He stole every verse I wanted to read in Sunday school. So if you weren't here, this is going to be new and exciting. And if you were here, it's new and exciting to me. Four times, Matthew 5, 17, he stands on the Sermon on the Mount. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. They should have fallen on their faces. All the law and the prophets, I didn't come to destroy them. I came to fulfill what they were pointing to all of those days. And Luke 24, 27, road to Emmaus. He's with those men after the the resurrection and they're they're despairing. And, And he begins, it says, with Moses and with all the prophets. He exegeted to them the things concerning himself in all of Scripture. Moses and the prophets pointed to Jesus. And then a couple of verses later in verse 44, Jesus said to those men, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, <clears throat> that all things which are written about me in the law and Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then in John 5, 39, he says to the Jews, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life but it's these that bear witness of me. You're searching your Old Testament scriptures thinking you're going to get eternal life from them, but what you don't realize is these scriptures have pointed to me and you're rejecting me. They point to me. Old Testament types become New Testament truths. Charles Spurgeon said, all roads in the Bible must lead to Christ. He's the fulfillment of it all. You want a good hermeneutic? Here Jesus is. It all pointed to me. Get in your Bibles and see how it points to Jesus Christ concerning his son. I got a long quote. I just want you to listen. I'm going to read it. I was debating. Norm Geisler summarized this whole idea as follows. That Christ is the seed of the woman in Genesis 3. He's the Passover lamb in Exodus 12. He's the atoning sacrifice in Leviticus 17. The smitten rock in Numbers 20 the faithful prophet in Deuteronomy. Christ is the captain of the Lord's host in Joshua, the divine deliverer in Judges, the kinsman redeemer in Ruth. (coughs) Christ is anticipated as the anointed one in Samuel. He's the son of David in 2 Samuel. In 1 and 2 Kings, Christ may may be viewed as the coming king. 1 and 2 Chronicles as the builder of the temple. Ezra represents Christ as the restorer of the nation. Esther portrays him as the preserver of the nation. Christ is seen as the living redeemer in Job and the the praise of Israel and the Psalms and the wisdom of God and the Proverbs. The great teacher in Ecclesiastes, the fairest of 10,000 in the Song of Solomon. 
Christ is the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, the maker of the new covenant in Jeremiah, the man of sorrows and lamentations, the glory of God in Ezekiel, the coming Messiah in Daniel 9. He's depicted as the lover of the unfaithful in Hosea, the hope of Israel in Joel 3, the husbandman in Amos, the Savior in Obadiah, the resurrected one in Jonah, the ruler in Israel of Micah, the avenger in Nahum, the, the holy God in Habakkuk, the king of Israel in Zephaniah, the desire of the nations in Haggai, the righteous branch in Zechariah, the son of righteousness in Malachi. Do you want me to do the New Testament? All right. I came to fulfill. Christ is presented the king of the Jews in Matthew, the servant of the Lord in Mark, the son of man in Luke, and the son of God in John. Christ is the ascended Lord in Acts. He's the believer's righteousness in Romans. He's sanctification in 1 Corinthians, sufficiency in 2 Corinthians, liberty in Galatians 2. He's revealed as the exalted head of the church in Ephesians, the Christian's joy in Philippians, the fullness of deity in Colossians, in Thessalonians. He's the believer's comfort and glory. He's seen as the Christian's preserver in Timothy, rewarder in 2 Timothy, the blessed hope of Titus, the substitute in Philemon. He's the high priest of Hebrews, the giver of wisdom in James and the rock in 1 Peter and the precious promise. John represents Christ as the life, the truth, and the way. And Jude portrays Christ as the advocate and revelation shows him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It's literally true that this Bible is about Jesus Christ. You miss Christ and you will miss God's gospel. I'm telling you, take him out and there is no good news. It's just a dark book. Add him and the the glory of God shines in the glorious gospel of God concerning his son, the radiance of his glory. And there is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. Christ alone. The whole letter of Romans then is the gospel of God. The key to the whole letter is Christ. His work, His merit, and His death. The gospel is His righteousness given to us by faith. And then the sanctification says you were joined to Him. And in this gospel, you're joined to Christ so that now you can begin to do the works of God that you could not do under the law. Union with Christ. He's our hope of glory in Romans 8, and He's our message, and He is our motivation. The gospel of God concerning His Son. What you do with Christ will determine your eternal destiny. Simeon held that little baby and said, Let thy bondservant depart, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. Concerning His Son, God's salvation. Paul wants to lay out what he wants us to consider then concerning His Son. And that's going to be in verses 3 through 4. Let me just read them to you real quick. <clears throat> Concerning his son, two things. He was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. He was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And I've spent a lot of time on this. <laughs> it just seems so simple, doesn't it? When you read it, it's, it's he's fully, fully man, seed of David, and fully God, and resurrection. It's just the heart of the gospel, Right? That is very true, and that's in here for sure. But I think Paul is going after something different and bringing up these two examples, and my goal this morning is to show you what I think it is. And I think Paul has given us a picture of Jesus' messianic career. He's telling us who the Son is, and it's more the stages and phases of the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises in Christ. And so he came as an anointed Messiah, And he's crowned as the mighty Lord. This is the gospel of God. The cross isn't mentioned, and I'm going to show you the cross is jammed in here from from every part of these two verses. So this is what will bring about the obedience of faith for his glory is this little nutshell that Paul wants you to see. The gospel of God right here, it's these two two things concerning his son that you must get. And I, I see Romans unpacking these two things the rest of our time together. So I want to take up these two statements this morning and see the fullness and the beauty of what Paul is telling us. So let's look at the first one. 
<coughs> he was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Paul is now clearly talking about the promised Messiah, who would be a descendant of David, and he will sit on his throne, and his kingdom will have no end. So clearly, this will be one who would be born from that lineage, from, from David, the seed that's promised. The, and, and they kept being told there's a promised Messiah that God's going to send. And that was the hope of Israel. They're waiting and they're looking for this promise. And, and, the, and they, they want this king to come who will throw down their enemies and the nations will come and bring their tribute. They've been waiting for that. That's how they missed his first coming. They didn't see a two advent theme. And so this one who is going to come and he's going to be born of the seed of David... And so literally, the Greek word says he, he became, he became from the seed of David. It's just so beautiful. The eternal son of God, Jesus, has always existed. And so he became what he was not before. And he's still fully God, but he comes and he, he becomes flesh. And he's born of the son of David so that he could be the promised one. And he would come in humanity and, and live under the law and fulfill it and die under the law in our place. So he was the ruler. He was the anointed one that was promised. He was in the line of David to conquer enemies, our sin. And so Jesus comes. He's born of a descendant of David. When? Well, when he was conceived in the womb of Mary and the angel came and told him that this would be the one whose kingdom, his throne would have no end. There, there became, at the beginning of his messianic rule then, the seed of David as, as the Holy Spirit uh, brings about this holy embryo in Mary. This was a new mode of existence for Christ. He's now taken on a human body. And as promised, a virgin shall be with child, and you shall name him Emmanuel, for God is with us. And so that embryo was fully God and fully man. Listen to Jeremiah 23.5. <clears throat> Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. That's the promise. Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his root, roots will bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And then in verse 10 of Isaiah 11, and will come about in that day that the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples and his resting place will be glorious. And then 2 Samuel 7, your house, David, your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne will be established forever. And so what, what a king that we are told about. All the nations will come and bow to this one and he'll be a place of rest and, pre and peace and righteousness and safety. This is the gospel of God. And so I want you to listen to the, all those promises. They began when he became the seed of David in the womb of Mary. This was the hope of Israel. This was the promise of God, what he would send to, to be this redeemer, to be this king. And I, and I love as you're reading in the gospel, there, there's blind Bartimaeus. And, and blind Bart says, Oh, Lord, son of David, have mercy upon me. The Seraphonician woman comes and says, Son of David. The triumphal entry, as he comes in, they're waving their palm branches saying, Hosanna to the son of David. This is the one, this is the promised king. Here he is, he's coming to rule right now and throw down Rome. They knew the promise of Messiah. They waited for their promised uh, king, the, the seed of David, who, who would show mercy to the poor and judge the wicked. They've been waiting for this. And Paul is now telling you, this is him. This one came. But there's one little phrase you can't miss. According to the flesh, in verse 3, he was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. He lived according to the flesh. And what he's saying is, is this is what characterizes flesh, weakness, <coughs> humility, submission and dependence. I just want you to get this. Christ entered into this realm and he took on a body with all of the weaknesses of a body. Fully God 
in a fully human body according to the flesh. And so don't miss this. He became a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had no place to lay his head. He was born in a, in a manger. The Messiah entered this world in human form according to promise. John MacArthur said, The whole New Testament acknowledges Jesus as the promised great king. In its 27 books, the term kingdom is used 144 times in referring to the reign of Jesus Christ. King is used directly of Jesus at least 35 times, and to reign is used of him some, seven, some 10 times. Christ is your awaited king. And in his humanness, he was born of David. Mary and Joseph were both descendants of David. And the prophets had declared that the Messiah then would come from this line, the seed of David. And in 1 John 4, 2, <clears throat> By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. And so the Antichrist will always lead away that this was fully God who entered into the promise to be Messiah in the womb of Mary and came as a seed of David to come be the king whose kingdom would have no end. So I want you to see that Jesus was the promised Messiah from all the Old Testament. He's from the seed of David. According to the flesh, he came in weakness and humility. And Jesus Christ went up on a cross. And he there was, he died. He breathed his last. He hung his head and gave up his spirit in our place. So in the weakness with this human body, Jesus Christ died in the place of sinners. And the apostles and his followers were so sad. And then we already have read on the road to Emmaus, they're walking and they said, we, we thought this one was the Messiah. This is the Messiah, the seed of David, what we've been waiting for. We thought this was the one and he was going to come rule and reign. And, and now he's a dead, dead Messiah. Kings don't die. They rule and reign and they destroy enemies. They protect us from safety. And we thought he was the one and he died. And then listen to this. In Luke 24, Jesus showed them that the Christ, the Messiah, had to die. And he showed them from all the Old Testament scriptures that, don't you see, this is what was promised. This is, this is the fullness of what you have been told. From the Old Testament, Jesus showed them this truth. And they said, as we, as we heard this, were not our hearts burning within us, seeing the fulfillment that Jesus had to come and die as the suffering servant in our place. Does the story end there? Well, we're told that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary then, after the, the, the burial, uh, they go to the tomb. And as they go to the tomb, the stone is rolled away. And the angel tells them that he has risen, just as he said. That is the gospel of God. And this David, what I want to show you in our second point then, is he will not undergo decay but this David has, has risen. And so let's look at our, our, our other point. He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. I love the Greek word for declared. It's the, the word haritzo. Haritzo, and it, it, it means to mark off boundaries. And so, so the English word, we get the word horizon. And the horizon is the line between the earth and the sky when you look out at the horizon. So it's to, to separate boundaries, to mark them off. And so what Paul is saying here is the work of Christ was marked off with absolute clarity in his resurrection. Absolute clarity is that Messiah was the Son of God. He's killed, he's crucified, he's put in a grave, and he's raised from the dead, and it just marked him off God. He raised others from the dead, and now he's raised himself from the dead. This is God. It's just marked it off. You ever doubt? You've ever wondered? He didn't undergo decay. He's not in a grave anymore. Up from the grave, he arose. <laughs> it's not Easter, but he's risen. <clears throat> Tim, I knew I could count on you, brother. The work of Christ was marked off. So what is going on here? What's, what's, what's uh, Paul talking about? Well, in Psalm 2, 
This is how they would have understood what's going on in this coronation language. In Psalm 2, today I have begotten thee. And what that was was coronation language. Not his birth, but his exalted position as a king. So he's, he's put on display, he's, he's enthroned. And so this is the king that was promised. And I want you to hear this. He didn't stay in a tomb and decay like King David. This is a greater David. And again, up from the grave, he arose with a mighty victory over his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. I want you to hear of the greater David. He is risen and he is Messiah. This is how we know he was the fulfillment. He was the promised one. He is God's gospel concerning his son, born of a descendant of David, raised the son of God with healing in his wings for the nations. I want you to listen to Paul in Acts 13. Paul stands up and he motions with his hands and he said, <coughs> Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. And for a period of 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. Guys, this is your whole Old Testament. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took uh, 450 years. And after these things, then he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. And then the people of Israel, they asked for a king. We want a king like all the other nations. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, and he gave him for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all of my will. And from the offspring of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. And John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not he. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I'm not even worthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the word of this salvation is sent out. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, all the prophets fulfilled these by condemning him, Jesus. All the prophets spoke of this. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he'd be executed. Crucify him, crucify him. And when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, all the prophets, they took him down from the cross and they laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. That God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, Thou will not allow thy holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep, he died. And he was laid among his fathers and he underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Take heed, therefore, 
so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers and marvel and perish, for I'm accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. The message and point that Paul is making quite simple, but the most profound truth in all of the world. It was not that Jesus was not the Son of God before the resurrection. But he moved from being born of the seed of David to be the Messiah in humility and weakness and death to now being crowned and raised up and enthroned with all authority. In Matthew 28, he says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He now is the, the head of the church, ruler over all, and he's endowed with salvation to anyone who will call upon his name. This is the reality that I proclaim to you. Paul says, this is the truth that I'm unashamed of. I, I will preach this Christ till I die. This is the gospel that I'm eager to preach to you who are in Rome. Today is the day of salvation. This gospel is God's. And it's rooted and grounded in his holy word. And it's about Jesus, who was Messiah and is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And he's able to save to the uttermost all who will draw near to God through him. One last verse. We read it this morning. Everybody was stealing my stuff. Sean Killian stole it. Uh, I think Brian handed it off to him. Everybody's stealing everything this morning. I'm, I'm going first next week. That's all there is to it. But I just want you to listen to this one last sermon by Peter because this is just taking my heart up. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I was always beholding the Lord in my presence, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will abide in hope, because thou will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, Thou will make me full of gladness with thy presence. End of quote. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God was sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. There it is right there. In his weakness, you crucified him, and God has made him both Lord and Christ. He is a Savior, a Messiah, and he is the Lord. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter, Brethren, what shall we do? What do we do? We killed the Son of God. Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. This is the center of the gospel. There's a promised Messiah who came, and he came in, in the seed, a holy embryo in Mary, Fully, fully man then, and he came in weakness so that he could go up on a cross and die in our place. And he was buried and he did not undergo decay. 
On the third day, he was raised. And this morning as we sit here, he has all authority over all for the gospel now to go to the ends of the earth. Paul says he was delivered up because of our transgressions. And he was raised because of our justification. And so here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we close, what I want to ask you is that this is the Lord. You, you, you come to Jesus for salvation. And this Jesus was a Messiah who died in your place. And he's a Messiah now who rules and reigns over all. And so anyone who comes to him comes to the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. And now he has authority over every part of your life. Everything. And to sit and just give him little pieces and play and hold on to your life and come to Jesus for a little makeover and not a takeover. Um, th this, this is what this demands. He is always called Lord and Savior. Messiah and, and risen Lord. And so he is a Savior. But he saves us to himself to have him be the Lord of Lords. And so have we believed this message, the obedience of faith. Have you believed it? And have you come under the kingship of Christ? I pray that playing around with Christ would die this morning and that every one of us would just come and say, Lord, and just, here it is, everything is yours. Everything. You have the right to, to not my plans. I surrender everything to you. And now my life is, I'm a do loss. I'm a bondservant of Christ. Whatever days you give me, they're going to be spent for Jesus Christ. For me to live as Christ and to die is going to be more Christ. That's what this gospel does to a heart. And so I pray that we would see this and that God would do his work of obedience of faith so that he would get glory that we'll look at next week. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this glorious gospel. I thank you that it's your gospel, and I thank you that it's concerning your son and what he has done. I thank you that he would humble himself and come and be born of a virgin and be born in a, a, a birth canal into a, a manger. God, I thank you for such a one that had no place to lay his head, one who could be persecuted and rejected, one who could be nailed up on a cross and could die in the place of sinners. God, this is a glorious gospel. Who could fathom a God who would do that with his own son? Who could fathom a son who would be a willing substitute? God, we thank you for its beauty. And Lord, I am so excited that this greater David didn't stay in the grave or we would have no hope here this morning. But he went into death and he broke its jaws. He snapped it. Where death is your victory, where is your sting? <coughs> the sting is the law. And he came and fulfilled it and satisfied its justice and ripped open now that there is the, the grave is our sweetest place now for the believer. Oh God, it brings us to a rest waiting for the resurrection of that day we'll be joined body and spirit together. God, thank you for this blessed hope and thank you that, that Jesus has been enthroned and he has all authority. And so God, let every heart here Surrender to this Christ. If there are any who have come in here who still think they're Lord of their lives, God, right now, let it die. Let them come before the real king and look at him as a Messiah dying on a cross in their place and let them bow their knee to the king of kings. God, would you do that work in any heart? Any life that's falling apart needs to be ordered under the lordship of Christ. God, would you let them see they don't need a 12-step program. They... They need to take the steps to Jesus Christ and bow this morning. God, let anyone who needs a Savior look to the one who's been resurrected and is now endowed with salvation. Let them call upon his name and be delivered from sin, Satan, and death. God, in the law, I pray that you would do that mighty work here this morning. And I pray for your children. God, I pray that we would, we would examine lives and have we surrendered the way we should to the one who has all authority, the one who has been raised up? Oh, Jesus, we cry against our own hearts and sin against such a king.
God, I pray that every heart would, would desire to be a doulos here this morning. That all we want to do is be your bondservants. Lord, open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds. What we are seeking is the obedience of faith. And I pray that just this beautiful gospel in its nutshell would transform and change every life to surrender to such a beautiful Christ. And, and it's in that sweet, precious name that we do pray this morning.